Okay, good morning, everybody, um, and welcome to today's TBI Talks webinar. I'm Ian Mullen, I'm the Executive Director for UK Policy here at TBI. And the title of our discussion this morning is The UK at a Crossroads, Framing the Economic Challenge. And today we're launching a discussion paper that seeks to do just that by my colleagues, uh, Steve Coulter and Christina Palmu. Um, and you can find that on our website and we'll send it out afterwards. Um, but for today's discussion, really, the, the question we're focusing on is, is about uh, what the UK should do at a critical moment in its economic history. It's often said that the economic structure of a country is very difficult to shift. For all the grand plans of successive ministers that come into office, it tends to be very hard to move the needle on the character, the strengths and weaknesses of a national economy. Uh, and especially to increase the rate of prosperity growth materially, uh, even if it's sometimes easier to damage prosperity growth uh, with certain policies uh, that we might have seen in recent years. Uh, but today we're facing the twin shocks of Brexit and the COVID pandemic that are creating uh, a far more profound change to the shape of the economy than almost anything we've seen, certainly for 40 years and possibly since the war. Um, and with the economy in this state of flux, there are opportunities and there are threats as well. So how should the government uh, respond? Recently, the government's produced its own plan for growth, and that's consigned the idea of industrial strategy uh, to the dustbin. And with it, the, in the Independent Industrial Strategy Council, which produced its final report yesterday, uh, perhaps somewhat pointedly underlining its call for longevity and coordination in its approach, in the government's approach uh, to industrial policy. Uh, now, we've got a fantastic panel of extremely knowledgeable people, uh, including top, two top politicians, to speak to us today. And they've all seen uh, th this question from a number of different sides. We'll hear from Peter Mandelson, uh, and among Peter's many past roles, he was the first Secretary of State at the Business Department, grappling with the fallout from the last major economic shock, the global financial crisis, uh, and pioneered a more targeted interventionist industrial policy approach uh, than what had been the norm for the previous 30 years. And then we'll hear from Margot James. Uh, Margot was the Minister of State for Digital, Telecoms and Creative Industries in the last Parliament, and she's now the Executive Chair of the Warwick Manufacturing Group. Uh, which is an international leader fostering collaboration between public and private sectors to turn academic innovation into commercial opportunities. So we'll hear from Steve, uh, Peter and Margot, uh, and then we'll open up uh, the floor to questions for the second half of the hour. So please do add your questions in the Q&A box and I will uh, try to group some of those and come to as many of you as possible uh, to put those questions to the panel. Uh, we'll end uh, promptly at 11 or as promptly as we as we can. Uh, okay, so let's kick off. And Steve, uh, you're the author of today's report. Can I ask you to give us a quick overview of, of what we're what we're saying today? Uh, thank you, Ian. Good morning, everybody, and welcome. Um, I have a very very short presentation uh, which I will now share. Um, okay, so this is a framing paper which is intended to set out the terrain for some future work to come from the Institute on things like technology policy, industrial strategies, state aid, uh, the future of work, skills policy, and green growth. And as Ian says, in the paper, we try and take a step back and look at the long-term challenges facing the UK economy and see what our strengths and weaknesses are and what needs to be done. So the economy really is at a crunch point at the moment, and it requires a fundamental rethink of how we pay our way in the global economy. We're currently emerging from the steepest recession in 100 years, but it's easy to forget that there are actually two shocks hitting us at the moment, COVID and Brexit. And these shocks are complementary. COVID hits the employment-rich domestic services sector, and Brexit has already been damaging inward investment in the export sector for several years. COVID should recede, although there could be some long-term damage to the economies of city centres and also to the human capital of those who have their education and training disrupted. But Brexit is, a, is prompting a long-term economic re realignment, trade shifts from the EU to the rest of the world. This is the intention of Brexiteers, of course, but our analysis in the report shows that some key industries are less competitive in world markets. These include previous export champions, such as financial and business services. Parts of manufacturing also lose out from potential loss 
of EU supply chains. Now, Brexiters argue that exporters can simply refocus onto global markets, but this ignores the, the effect that distance has on trade and the fact that trade deals in services can be quite difficult to achieve. And all this comes on top of some legacy issues. So low productivity growth, the weakest in 250 years in the last decade, really high wage industries located in the Southeast, uh, precarious work, something like 10 million people on insecure, poor skills, particularly the intermediate skills which are important uh, for manufacturing. And some big future challenges lie ahead, so achieving net zero carbon emissions and also handling the disruption of technology, which leads to changes to commercial and work patterns. To make the most of these opportunities, we need to do it with an economy that's not over-reliant on a few sectors which are vulnerable to Brexit and the aftermath of the pandemic. So it's time that we rethink uh, the UK's economic model. Uh, optimistically, we think there's a big space for strategic intervention by government to push the UK economy onto a much higher growth path. There are huge opportunities in growing markets that our analysis shows play to some UK strengths, such as renewables, electric vehicles, and life sciences. But realizing this potential requires uh, re reviving some lost manufacturing capabilities, creating better institutions for commercializing research, more patient finance, and obviously improving skills. The vaccines, for example, the recent revival of the auto industry, uh, development of cheap wind power, all show the potential for policies like industrial strategy. So the government's clearly not afraid of intervention, and there's also plenty of activity, but does this constitute a plan? We would argue not necessarily. There are two areas where the government does seem to have a proper strategy, net zero and infrastructure. But these are probably not enough in themselves to carry the UK economy onto a new growth path, although net zero certainly carries huge opportunities if managed properly. Junking industrial strategy, as the government has done, does suggest a reluctance to think strategically about the economy and certainly seems to rule out taking a sectoral approach, which was very fruitful with the, um, with the, the development of vaccines. But it also signals to, to firms and investors that any supply side commitments made by governments are really not to be relied upon for more than a year or two. Ditching the Industrial Strategy Council suggests an unwillingness to be constrained or judged on the effectiveness of what it's doing. And many of the flagship policies from Freeports to Dominic Cummings Science Agency suggest a rather magpie-like approach to policy. All in all, we're not really sure that this approach is really up to the task of dealing with the challenges the UK faces. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. That's a good setup for our discussion. Peter, if I come to you next, do you want to uh, kick us off? Yeah. Look, thanks very much for asking me to join this morning, I, because I really think this is a very compelling analysis. I read the paper. Um, and it's perfectly clear to me <laughs> that we are indeed at a crossroads uh, in our country and we've got some fairly profound choices to make. Um, I mean, let me give a, a helicopter view, uh, if I may. Look, Brexit and the de-Europeanisation uh, of the UK economy, because that's what we're doing, can take us down a road uh, of national decline. Or we can regard Brexit as a sort of thunderbolt, uh, which we need to turn into a catalyst for national revival. So I am definitely for the latter. Uh, I am for revival, not decline. Uh, but that means dedicating huge effort uh, to reshaping the UK uh, economy. The UK's economic challenge, which is going to be massively exacerbated uh, by the impact uh, of Brexit is this. You know, we have some um, globally super competitive sectors, uh, but in a wider economy that performs mediocrely in productivity in it, and whose high value added performance is concentrated in London and the Southeast. Now, successive uh, UK governments have sought to overcome this because it's not new uh, and to support high growth technology led um, enterprise uh, through different policies. My efforts were in 1998 with my white paper, building a knowledge driven economy. 
and then after I returned to government in 2008 uh, with another iteration, new industry, new jobs. In my view, the best further expression of policy there's been uh, is Greg Clark's industrial strategy in 2017-18, uh, with its very carefully selected uh, challenges uh, and missions. The central point in my view, Ian, is this. Technological change, you know, the driver of productivity and economic growth, is not like the weather. It doesn't just happen around us. It can be supported and it can be shaped. And that's why successive governments have tried to do so by creating um, an innovation system which combines public uh, and private funding, uh, major research partnerships, helpful government regulation, and fostering supply chains, individual entrepreneurship, uh, and business growth. The problem has been a lack of consistent vigor and vision. It, it, it has never been a true priority or centerpiece of uh, policy uh, in successive governments. There's been too much dissipation of effort, a failure to build durable uh, industrial strategy policy, uh, and a failure to build lasting institutional arrangements and relationships. And the contrast with countries you know, like Germany and France is very striking. Now, my fear now is that we're embarking all over again on this sort of roundabout of reinvention, you know, with the scrapping of industrial strategy uh, and its replacement uh, by a growth plan. I, I don't want to get hung up on labels, though. I, I prefer to focus on, uh, on concepts. And a very good concept uh, is looking the government in the face uh, with the experience uh, of the vaccine uh, development. I mean, this was born out of necessity at a time of national crisis. Uh, the government had the agility and confidence uh, to staff up and itself invest in a portfolio of high risk technology ventures. Um, through a vaccine ta ta uh, task force led by a venture capitalist. So we get, so we got um, public funding of research, big time, invention by Oxford University, nimble accelerated regulation by the government, manufacture by the private sector uh, and distribution by the National Health Service. I mean, one thing this isn't is a model of pure capitalism. I mean, it is government adding heft and heavy lifting to the operation of markets, demonstrating, by the way, the power of public uh, procurement. Now, this provides, in my view, as good a model as we could wish for of coordination across the board across government, but across beyond government to the private sector and to the universities. And I think that we should be urgently looking at how we can apply variations of this model to working in other fields, uh, in, in, in other sectors. I think we need to secure our existing high performing sectors, but add to them uh, to build a critical mass of high performance distributed across England and the nations of the UK. And this is where, in the first instance, uh, Greg Clark's four grand challenges uh, come in. For my money, they remain, three, four years later, the challenges and the missions that should define the decades ahead. Because unlike leveling up, um, what uh, Greg's missions were, were tangible, measurable public goals. I mean, the use of artificial intelligence and data in health, aging society and extending people's lives, clean growth, and the future of uh, mobility. Now, the task is to marry up our science and technology base and workforce skills to the markets being built out 
from these digital AI and decarbonizing transitions. We've got to identify the business and commercial opportunities uh, that are linked uh, to these, and then focus government support on the whole supply chain so that innovation and production coheres in the way that we saw with the vaccine. And be willing, by the way, to take risks in doing this, to act at scale, we do things far too small in Britain, and to avoid this ever widening plethora uh, of, of, of new initiatives. And alongside the challenges and missions, I think we need a clear focus on the geographical uh, dimension and how a strategic approach uh, is going to draw on local knowledge uh, and skills. This government just doesn't seem to realize that you can't level up from the top down. Uh, they've just got the wrong idea about this. I mean, local foundations of economic growth need powers, they need people, and they need money. And it's puzzling to me that for all the talk of regional policy, ministers so far seem more interested in a sort of centralized fund pork barrel way of working and showy trophy projects rather than working through the major infrastructural supply side issues uh, that regions and localities uh, face. I'm going to pause there if I may. I've got more to say about R&D and science and universities, but let, let me pause and come back to the other things I want to suggest during the course of our discussion. Thanks, Peter. That's a, it's a great way to start us off. I just wanted to throw a question at you about the politics of this. Um, I mean, obviously, the, go the government's come in with the, the, the plan for growth that it produced. I mean, to what lots of governments, ministers, uh, changes uh, of government, at, at the time of a change of government, want to you know, underline that things are different and they want to shift the deck chairs around. In your reading of it, to what extent is this a deck chair rearrangement versus a profound philosophical shift away from that previous 2017 strategy? I don't believe the present government under the prime, present prime minister have a coherent single economic philosophy. Uh, I, I think the, current the government's philosophy is part pro-market, part pro-statist, part open and part protectionist or sovereigntist as, uh, as Brexiters would call it. And my fear, Ian, in this is that this will lead basically to an incoherent series of politically influenced, disjointed, zigzagging policies that will fail to convince uh, uh, markets and investors, both domestically and internationally, uh, and will simply not bring about the deep and the durable change that the country uh, uh, needs. We desperately need continuity of policy, institutions, people, officials and ministers. My God, what a difference it would make if we had people running an industrial strategy who were there for more than 10 minutes. We need to be taking people on a, on a journey. We've got to set out the next sort of chapter in Britain's national story at the heart of which is this reshaping of the UK uh, economy. At the moment, we're like a sort of box of fireworks. You know, everything is lit and tried, set off, see where this goes, a rocket here, a Catherine wheel uh, 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 there. Um, and uh, I mean, that sort of mentality we associate quite strongly with Dominic Cummings. But let me just say this about Dominic Cummings. He had very big ideas. He had a very big personality, as we know. He was very, very pushy uh, for science and R&D spend uh, in, in government. It took him a long while, but he would get his way. And in what he's created, or what the government is creating in ARIA, you know, this sort of UK version of ARPA, I think is very interesting. I just don't think that, that whilst I'm not against moonshots and 
big picture inventions, you know, they are not going to bring about the granular change um, in our sort of innovation system, in our product productivity uh, performance um, uh, and across the country of the sort that we need. So there's a place for everything here, but I just feel the government is, I just don't think they have a clear, single, coherent, philosophical idea of what they're doing in this area. Great, thank you. That's a good uh, point at which to go, Margot, to you as you sort of stand at the nexus of this kind of public and private coordination and innovation. Um, uh, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Ian, um, and um, fascinating discussion so far. Um, thanks to everybody, particularly um, the report that you've just produced at TBI um, and that Steve took us through. Um, it shows quite clearly that um, we are indeed at a crossroads um, and the big things that we've got to deal with are the aftermath of the COVID crisis and the dislocation in the country's economic fortunes that that has brought about, as well as, well as um, Brexit. And the direction of travel with Brexit is, is not, it might be clear in terms of the preference of the government over, for sovereignty, um, over market access and employment, which concerns me. Um, but the actual impact on trade, I think, is has yet to be really seen in terms of to what extent um, are the problems that are undoubtedly being incurred by our exporters. Um, to what extent are they uh, teething problems? To what extent are they long term? We've then got the Northern Irish issue. Um, and in my present role at WMG, we um, are at the forefront of the electric vehicle revolution and the automotive industry. And 80% of UK's automotive sector is for export, and 55% of those exports go to Europe. So whilst the attractions of growth markets around the world are very real, um, we do need to be able to um, support the automotive sector as it trades with its main trading partner. Um, I was very concerned by what Peter had to say about the way that the industrial strategy looks like being uh, replaced with a plethora of new initiatives. Um, the industrial strategy was very close to my heart. I was one of Greg Clark's um, junior ministers at the time that he was developing it, and I supported the development of it. I believed passionately in it, and I think it's done some fantastic work. Um, but um, some of the replacement policies, um, the plan for growth, the national infrastructure plan, the R&D roadmap, the skills white paper, the green industrial revolution, and ARIA um, are, um, all have potential. Um, I think they are, all are going down the right direction. Um, but I do agree with Peter that um, there is a need for a coherent plan that pulls these things together, that makes sure that they deliver for business and growth across the board, but also on a sector by sector basis. Um, Peter talked about the, the immense success um, that the government's had with the Vaccines Task Force. In a sense, that was the Vaccines Task Force um, and its agenda and what it's delivered has been um, a sort of accelerated version of one of the sector deals that um, took hold under the industrial strategy. Um, and individual sectors do have very specific requirements which can't all be left to the market. Um, and we've seen the success with vaccines. We could have a similar success in this country with um, the, the revolution in transport. Steve, you mentioned those three areas of our strengths in this country, um, potential electric vehicles, life sciences and renewables. Um, but electric vehicles do require a coordinated government policy that directs itself against the building blocks that are needed in order for Britain not just to, uh, you know, succeed in electric vehicles. We're not just talking about that. We're talking about the survival of our automotive industry, because if we can't get the battery production in this country that powers the new electric vehicles, which will be all on our roads by 2030, then um, the, the companies, the manufacturers will slowly 
place their manufacturing elsewhere to be near the source of the battery production, because a battery is going to be at least 30%, if not 40% of the value of the overall motor vehicle. So it's essential, and there's a lot of different things that need to be got right in that space that won't necessarily be got right if um, we just put 400 million up, which is what the government's budget is at the moment, um, which compares itself to billions in Germany and France, by the way, for the same thing, um, and, and leave it to the market. Um, so there is a need for a strategy, um, whether it's called a, an industrial strategy or something else. Um, the low level of business investment in, the U in R and D in the UK has been a long-standing issue, um, the gov and I applaud the government's um, determination to 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 get um, R and D spend up to two point four percent of the G of GDP. It's not enough, but at least it's a big step in the right direction. Um, but we have to have delivery vehicles that enable that um, R and D spend to be more to be distributed around the country because at the moment it is so overwhelmingly dominated um, by London and the South East. The Golden Triangle gets the lion's share of all public investment in R&D and the West Midlands um, and the North West are at the very bottom of the pecking order when it comes to public R&D investment. Um, so that there's a real um, a sort of invisible driver for every government body that exists, you know, be it UKRI, be it Innovate UK, um, to focus that public money into the golden triangle that we need to have a very proactive, um, determined um, policy goal if we're, if we're to um, reverse that, that trend and invest in our regions. Um, second, the, the focus on levelling up, and I look forward to seeing exactly what is meant by levelling up in terms of regional policies, um, but when we were developing the industrial stra strategy, one of the big drivers was um, the improvement of people's life chances in areas where there had been a lack of investment in both skills and R&D. We wanted people to have access to better paid um, employment and better life chances. Um, and what we can't do is assume that um, even if the government can get growth back into the economy, that, that the fruits of that growth will trickle down to people in poorer areas, people who have not had the investment in their education that, that we would all want them to have had. Um, that's not gonna happen. You know, years ago, the trickle down economics worked um, it stopped working, I certainly, uh, uh, during the financial crisis, um, and I don't see any sign of it returning without real effort and proactive policy on the part of government. Um, and when you look at the way the gig economy has um, developed and the precarious nature of so much low paid employment, um, I think this is a great concern and something that we were trying to do when I was a business minister with Matthew Taylor and his Taylor review of employment um, law and practices, particularly in the digital economy. Um, and we're, we seem now to be relying on the courts to make that policy. Um, and we've seen two very landmark um, Supreme Court decisions, one on the care sector and one um, on the Uber drivers case, which took, I think, five or six years to come to the, the right place, in my opinion, um, which was where we were trying to get it to when I was in the business department of, of giving gig economy workers um, more, uh, more security of, of benefits and so forth, whilst preserving some flexibility in the operation that, um, that people want. So I think that we need to really focus on that side of what was underpinning the industrial strategy as well. Um, and in terms of the other really important things like net zero, advanced computing, um, from AI to the Internet of Things, all of these things um, do need some government direction, um, some some structure to pull academics and industrial research together to make sure that we've got the skills from the people who need digital skills 
at the lower paid end of the economy, right up to sufficient numbers of PhDs who have specialisms in data, in AI, and in the forward um, technologies of automation that are going to get our economy cleaner and greener and our employment prospects for people um, better skilled and better paid. Um, so I think um, I've probably said all I need to say just at the moment, um, Steve, very happy obviously to contribute to the Q&A and hear people's questions and issues and enjoy the discussion. Thank you very much. Thanks, Margot, that's fantastic. Um, I wondered whether you could give us your sense on, in terms of the government plan for growth. Um, one, one reading of it is that actually a lot of the substance of what was going on before will remain. Uh, some things won't, but a lot of it will. Um, uh, but the, a lot of the narrative and you know, the grand challenges and these kind of things has sort of been dropped. And from your perspective, where you are trying to create that coordination between innovators and the market economy, uh, and investors and, uh, and sitting at the nexus of that, uh, uh, um, those different entities. How important is that kind of narrative and direction from the center versus just getting the policy right? Is that, is that a big loss? Um, I think that I rather agree with um, what Peter said about how you can't level up from the center. You can't rely on direction from the centre. I do very much applaud the direction um, to enabling regions to have more autonomy um, and more involvement in, in setting their own agendas, whether that is around skills, um, broadband and the other vital infrastructure needs um, that, that we have. Um, so I, I think that the, the thinking behind the growth plan is 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 solid and sound but i don't think it's enough um it's you know that the sort of macro sweep is not going to um get us where we need to be in some of these challenging areas like the transition um to carbon free transport mm. um and i and i think that a sector-based approach is is essential really in terms of the public private partnership that is needed um, to galvanize the growth to compete with other countries um, who seem to have less problem with the you know intellectual grip of the public sector working with the private sector um, and supported by national and regional government than we do as a as a country um, so i'm hoping i think that the government's got some of it's thinking absolutely right, but I do think that a sector-based approach is essential um, if we're to enable industry to overcome the challenges and obstacles that are in its path, much of which need releasing by government. And, and just one further question, so Peter raised it as well, um, the, the, the uh, case study of the vaccine production in the UK um, that the Industrial Strategy Commission highlighted yesterday. Um, I mean, to, in your view, how much of a um, template is that? Is that, it, it seems to me like a quite a specific example that perhaps has a lot of lessons for certain areas, but how generalizable is it in your view? Um, I think we've got to make it generalizable. And um, one area, um, what's been so unique about it is the speed with which it has been accomplished. Uh, and when you look at the way, government walks through treacle on so many things. I mean, just give you one example, which I'm sure we're all familiar with, apprenticeships and skills policy. And the, the great idea of the levy to, to oblige big industry, big companies to fund proper training, great idea ruined by um, trammeling it, so it, it, wrapping it so tight in regulation that the companies couldn't in the end spend half their levy pot, totally self-defeating. And it's been going on for five years or more. And so many things grind through going wrong, not being rescued without that kind of big impetus that's got behind the vaccines task force. Um, so I think it's a, a psychological mindset gear shift that we need to apply that kind of energy to a few key things that this country has got to achieve over the next five to 10 years and, and learn the lessons. 
I mean, we were fortunate with the Vaccines Task Force in that we do have a brilliant life sciences sector in this country. We have a brilliant higher education sector in this country. And it was a health crisis uh, that um, we were bringing everything to bear upon. Um, it, you know, if that had happened in a sector where Britain has lost its way, we probably wouldn't have been able to do so well. Okay, fantastic. Let, let's go to go to quite a few good questions coming in now. There's um, one here from Rowena Lee and another from uh, Fiona Wishlade, both talking about the kind of regional dimension. So maybe if I could come to Rowena first uh, to ask your question. Rowena, can you hear us? Hello, um, I'd like to know um, how would um, the first speaker prioritise amongst the three factors um, productivity, technology and carbonization, and regional inequality leveling. And how would this relate to cities as a powerhouse? And uh, should and would UK keep the focus on cities? And uh, the second question is about, um, may I know if we would choose leveling up of skills from the general public or for the talented limited group only? Thank you. Thanks, Rubio. Uh, and then there's another question here uh, from Fiona, uh, Fiona Wishlade, if I could unmute uh, you, Fiona, you've got a question at RDAs. Uh, yes, uh, thanks very much. Um, yeah, I was just wondering if you would um, advocate a return to um, regional development agencies, given that, that England is now, uh, I, I think, the most uh, centralised um, uh, large large economy and whether you have any any observations on the way in which the internal market act um, trampled over parts of the economic development competences of the uh, devolution acts uh, in in relation to uh, scotland and wales thank you very much fantastic thanks Fiona. okay uh peter could i come to you with those first um can i what was the first question the first the skills sorry well, the, I, I'd like to comment on two things. One, one is skills and the other is um, uh, RDAs. Um, I, uh, I have quite strong uh, views which favour reform of our higher education sector. Put that aside uh, for one moment. Um, I, I think that university reform uh, should go hand in hand with a reprioritising uh, of the government's funding to further education. Uh, I think Margot was right to link, you know, individual life chances to industrial strategy. I think we need to generate uh, amongst uh, young people um, uh, a, a sense of aspiration, self-improvement, uh, a focus on vocational and technician uh, learning, uh, which we talk about, successive governments talk about, but really don't uh, prioritize uh, uh, sufficiently. Um, I mean, we, we achieved as a, as a government, our aim of 50% of young people um, having the chance to go to university. I think that's wonderful. I defend it. I think it's a great achievement. It's great for the individuals. It's great for social mobility. It's great for individual opportunity, and it's great for the economy. Um, but I, I, I do think that the country's vocational and technician needs require uh, provision for the other 50% of the cohort who choose not to go to university or who would like to take a different route uh, as I tried to promote uh, when I was in charge of uh, um, uh, uh, higher and further education in the last year of the Labour government, different routes into higher education. You know, the classic sort of sixth form, um, you know, do your finals, go into university, move on, etc. There will be other young people who perhaps think that going into an institute of technology or a further education college or whatever uh, is something they would prefer to do at that stage. Um, and then perhaps progress to university afterwards. I'm chancellor of Manchester Metropolitan University. We have the largest number of uh, degree apprentices of any such university uh, in the country. They're great. 
wonderful people. I love talking uh, to them. And when I was, because what they do is combine, um, you know, they have a foot in both camps, as it were, the university camp and the business, the employer, uh, a workplace camp. Um, when I was when I was trying to remodel things, uh, we created modern apprenticeships. They were basically lab assistants and technicians rather than, you know, welders and plumbers, um, or in addition to welders uh, and, and plumbers. And I think that we've got to think think much more imaginatively and much more creatively. Uh, but I do think uh, that successive governments uh, have talked about this a lot without actually delivering, and it's got to be a priority. On RDAs, this was a piece of institutional vandalism by the incoming coalition government in 2010. Um, it was gratuitous. It was a sort of tabula rasa, not invented by us, year zero mentality, uh, which just said, well, you know, let, let's label these um, bureaucratic and inefficient justify our abolishing them. Uh, let's set up LEPs uh, instead, uh, which uh, uh, had some virtues, but in many other ways, huge deficiencies. They were not very suboptimal in many ways. And now even this government is sort of sidelining uh, the LEPs. You never hear them spoken about uh, uh, anymore. And I think the problem with this is that what the government is seeking is, as I said, a sort of pork barrel model. You know, it's great to have these central funds. Ministers dispense money, pork, um, almost invariably to conservative members of parliament who go up and bid for their local trophy uh, products and then can come back uh, with a great check signing. Here we are, we've tarted this up, we've make this difference to the high street. Yeah. The, 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 this is not serious structural long-term um, uh, uh, change uh, that you need uh, in towns, former coal field, uh, uh, communities and parts of the country outside you know, the metropolitan areas, which really need uh, uh, a much more serious uh, thinking and government uh, uh, intervention, both to level up the infrastructure that exists underpinning the, the local economy, but frankly to, and, and this is what's eluded successive governments, the, the replacement of the former local economy, coal field, industrial or whatever, with a new sort of private sector business spine uh, that needs to be implanted into towns and local communities in order to uh, recreate uh, a, a, a local economy, which is rooted in, in real business, enterprise, entrepreneurial uh, activity. And that's where I would like to see the focus. And I think that creating um, uh, 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 the RDAs as we did may not have been perfect, but they are instruments of policy. You know, they are methods, uh, they, they, they represent a methodology uh, of intervention by government, a way of transferring resources uh, and, and, and power and decision-making, tapping into local knowledge and local expertise and skills and creating a sense of inclusiveness, of accountability. You know, what's wrong with that? And I, I think that's the way we've got to go in the future. Uh, I think it's indispensable. We've got to put more decision-making, more devolution, more money, more people uh, uh, into, uh, into different parts of uh, the country so that it's not simply, by the way, locked up in you know, fast-changing inner city areas, uh, but which can have uh, ramifications and impact uh, beyond uh, into hinterland of cities, into towns, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and into rural areas. So that's where I think we've got to go. I don't think there's any likelihood of the government going along that uh, path. That's not their style, it's not their model. Uh, they would pro prefer 
you know, the centralized funds, the check signing, the trophy projects, uh, and, you know, the page two lead in the local newspaper. It's not serious structural change, in my view. Margot, what, what's your take on, on the regional growth angle? Oh, oh, well, I've got to be, I've got to be more optimistic than Peter. Um, although what Peter was saying just fills me with dread because it's precisely the sort of politics that I um, dislike intensely um, because it, it, it just shortchanges um, the people who, who need the investment the most. Um, so I would suggest that rather than, I mean, obviously, you know, things don't come back, you know, the re regional development agencies are not going to come back, but there is in place um, some pretty good regional infrastructure that if it was supported and unleashed, um, I think it does have the potential to um, uh, really get galvanize this country's economy um, across its length and breadth and not just focusing on the um, high value areas as we currently know them. Um, I think one of our questions was about whether cities should be the powerhouse. Um, and I think that cities undoubtedly take the lead, but there's got to be an infrastructure in place to make sure that they don't monopolize. Because um, if you take, say, you know, the Northwest, there's a whole huge economy up there. It's not just Manchester and Liverpool. Um, and there's got to be um, some pull factors to enable the surrounding towns and rural areas to benefit from investment. And, and better paid um, employment. Um, and that I think has to come from a devolved, the structures we've got at the moment, the combined authorities in, in much of the country and the directly elected mayors, I think can play a very big part in making sure that cities don't dominate completely. If you take a, 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 an area like mine, the West Midlands, uh, we've got a mayor, um, and, but he's got a combined authority of six major metropolitan authorities. It's not just Birmingham. Um, and of course, he is accountable to the, the regional population, not just the Birmingham population. I think that's very important um, because there are pockets of fabulous ecosystems around cities. Um, down the road from Warwick University is um, Leamington Spa, which is the home for a really great ecosystem of the gaming industry. Um, and we've got really good technology companies um, on a spine that links from Birmingham to Leamington Spa. And we've got to have a system which enables those towns and smaller places to benefit from, from the growth of the overall region. And actually with the COVID crisis and the fact that people no longer have to work where they uh, have to live where they work, um, don't necessarily have to commute in the same way as they used to, um, will, I think, enable people to live much more where they want to live. And that will also be a pull factor for making sure that the cities don't gobble up all of the regional improvements that we all want to see. Thanks, Margot. And, and Steve, do you want to come in on this, and, and particularly the kind of it's part of the regional approach to industrial strategy it seems to be part of the chopping and changing uh, problem that we've seen. What, what's your kind of take on, on where the government's going on this? Yeah, so on, on, on the regional approach, I mean, there, there is a problem um, with the UK economy. It's very sort of focused on um, university clusters. You know, we, the, the, the most successful part of the UK is um, financial services, business services, um, and also sort of high-end tech and manufacturing. These tend to be located in university towns, particularly in the southeast of England, or the big cities. So not just London, but places like Leeds and Edinburgh have financial uh, powerful financial sectors. So if you have growth sort of um, being concentrated around these areas, then that's where all the high productivity jobs, uh, that's where all the sort of graduates move to, they earn high, high wages, but they leave the rest of the country behind. So I think there is, then this is a clear structural issue um, where if you are gonna level up, then you need to shift away from just these high-end services and the advanced manufacturing clusters. Um, so that is a clear structural um, issue. That's something you need to change. You don't want to wreck these things. You don't want to shoot the golden goose, but you do need to find other um, areas um, of growth. And that's why, you know, that's why manufacturing is so important. And it's easier to sort of bang on too much about the um, industrial strategy. 
and, and, and the, now the lack of industrial strategy. Um, but I think you can you can define industrial strategy and manufacturing quite broadly. Um, so you can talk about the importance of skills. You can talk about the servitization of manufacturing. So it's not just about making things, it's now about leasing things and the services that go with this. So manufacturing really is central um, to the economy and therefore industrial strategy is pretty important. And so just return to this, this issue of why we keep popping and changing. I think, um, you know, we, we're we not that bad at industrial strategy. You know, we've done it sort of reasonably successfully over the last sort of 20 years or so. The trouble is we, what we tend to be quite good at in this country is sort of solving market failures, but fixing particular issues um, in markets, a, a lack of public goods such as infrastructure, for example. Uh, what we're not so good at and what we do very inconsistently is the kind of structural change that um, Peter and Margot have been talking about and that we talk about in the report. And for that, you really do need a government that knows what it's doing and has a plan. And you need the structures to be able to deliver this. Um, when you think about electric vehicles, for example, these are this is a hefty investment. It's a very, very, very risky area. Companies uh, will want someone to give a lead, preferably another company, a big company. But if not, then a then the government. Governments can give the lead. And so if you don't get this initial push, um, then you simply don't get industry moving into things like electric vehicles, even though it's clearly in their collective interest. That's why industrial strategy is so important. It's about moving on from doing these market failures, moving into, into a much clearer strategic direction. That unfortunately is where we come a cropper. We seem to be able to do the market failures, but we don't seem to be able to do the big strategic thing. And, and the problem is, um, as both Peter and Margot have mentioned, new business secretaries come in, they wanna do something different and they tear up um, what's been done before. They, they go back to year zero. Um, the, the whole idea of the Industrial Strategy Council was to provide some continuity. That's now been ripped up. That sends the message that, you know, anything any government does on the supply, on the supply side is not really to be trusted. And they're gonna leave things to the market, even if that was not their, necessarily their intention. Thanks, Steve. I think we've got a quick time for uh, a couple more questions. Uh, there's one here um, from David Brito, which I think really exemplifies uh, part of the issue here that, you know, we have uh, the um, uh, one of the UK's key sectors, leading sectors, has really been hit quite hard. Um, David, you want to talk about the city. Do you want to come in and ask your question? Hi, everyone. My question is, is the loss of prominence of financial services in the economy a good or a bad thing? Good because policymakers are at last noticing other parts of the economy, or bad because it was one of the few things the UK was really good at before? Great, thanks. And, uh, and Anton Spisak has a question about the institutional arrangements and the Treasury's role. Anton, do you want to come in? Uh, yes, thanks, Diana. I had a question about um, the institutional foundations on which to make economic policy decisions. And the one striking thing about the new growth plan is that it puts the Treasury in charge of the new industrial strategy. And as a for former civil servant, it's, it slightly distresses me because the Treasury has a certain economic outlook and a certain way of thinking about making policy decisions, which is actually actually quite different from the kind of long termism that uh, policies like industrial, industrial policy need. What do you think about this recent change? And how do you think we can build stronger institutional foundations for long-term policies? Great, thank you very much. I'm sure both Peter and Margot had their experiences of uh, working with the Treasury. So uh, I'd be interested to hear what you had to say. We've only got a couple of minutes left, but Margot, if I could come to you first and then Peter, I might end with you if that's all right. Um, thank you, Ian. Um, well, I was very concerned by this development that the Treasury seems to have taken over uh, direction of the substitute industrial strategy policy. I, I, I simply find it almost incredible that, um, that that should have been allowed to happen. I mean, the only good thing about it is that it will get more investment, um, li likely to get more investment, um, because it won't suffer from the not invented here syndrome which scuppers so much good policy in government. Um, but, but really, um, the Treasury have brilliant people, but they're not expert in, in the country's industrial challenges. Um, they're expert more in economic and financial policy. Um, and I'm, I'm concerned that the, the expertise that resides elsewhere in government 
I will play second fiddle to the Treasury and that that will not be a good thing for what our industrial sectors need. Um, and in answer to the first question about financial services, um, I mean, I think it's absolutely crazy to jeopardise one of Britain's most successful sectors. In this very, very cutthroat competitive world, there is no room for any country that thinks it can sit on its laurels, that can think it can um, play Russian roulette with one of its most successful sectors um, for, for some reason that, you know, it might be all right on the night in five years time that's absolutely reckless so i would say you know you need to look after you need to cherish and nurture your successful sectors like financial services and life sciences um, and and you need to to build on them um, not jeopardize one thinking that something else will turn up fantastic thank you peter finally to you i think the uk economy is too exposed to the financial services sector uh, and my a solution to that is to build up the other sectors, not to downgrade financial. I mean, the financial services sector is very important for us. Um, it's a huge earner internationally. It's a huge source of revenue uh, for the treasury uh, and therefore finances the you know, public, public realm. Um, it has to be regulated uh, properly. We didn't get that completely right. We were far too much on the free market, Alan Greenspan uh, side of the argument when it came to uh, um, uh, 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 regulating financial services. We were too market fundamentalist in my view. Okay, that's being corrected, possibly overcorrected, I don't know. Um, but I would rather see us concentrating on building up other parts of the economy rather than trying to demote or downsize financial services. Obviously, it's going to be difficult for us. This is a huge Brexit uh, challenge. I think the chances of our getting work serviceable, durable regulatory equivalence arrangements and agreement with the European Union um, is slight. I'm not even sure that the financial services sector is seeking that anymore uh, because they don't want the uncertainty uh, uh, because you can be equivalent one moment and then at, the, at, a, at a policy whim, not equivalent the next. Not sure they want that sort of uncertainty. I think they've given up waiting. And in any case, it's not a negotiating priority for the government uh, in, the, in the context of our relationship uh, with the European uh, Union. On the Treasury, my experience of the Treasury certainly in my last uh, period in government, was that almost invariably the first response of the Treasury to anything will be to say no. Once they've been dragged over a line, if they have, they will then make available a sort of fairly sparse piecemeal amount of money for whatever it is that we're trying to do. They don't like scale. And even when they do make money available, they create so many hoops and conditions and requirements <laughs> to, 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 for anyone to access the sum of money. Uh, the process is so painful that many people would not bother or give up soon after they start the process. I think the mentality of the Treasury changed somewhat under Osborne, not fundamentally. I think Philip Hammond, who was a very dry sort of chancellor, you know, did interesting things. He was eventually persuaded to set up British patient capital within the British uh, uh, Business Bank, uh, which I think uh, is important uh, because making available venture and growth funds to, uh, uh, to start up some growing companies uh, is a really, really important part of the innovation system. I would make uh, the British patient capital uh, a permanent feature uh, of our sort of financial architecture uh, in this area. Um, uh, I would also reform it. I would make it you know, less attuned to the sort of short-term horizon of most of the venture capital uh, sector. Uh, I would make it more freestanding at the moment it's arrangements for working and not in my view completely satisfactory um so the treasury is capable 
of doing good things uh, with the right political uh, leadership. And you could argue that the very substantial uptick in funding for R&D, for science spending, um, uh, is, 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 is a very good move, a very good decision uh, by the Treasury, by the Chancellor. Um, my fear is that it may not be sustained. I, I think that a, the 2021-21-22 uh, financial settlements, uh, R&D has really uh, benefited. I think later this year, there'll be a further spending review. And when we get to the sort of 22, 23 uh, period, the chancellor is going to be thinking about, you know, getting debt onto a, a downward uh, path. I think there will be many, many other spending priorities competing uh, for, for this cash uh, within the government, uh, priorities which have more immediate political appeal. Uh, and uh, impact. And I'm not sure, I hope I'm wrong, I hope I'm wrong, but I'm not sure there's really minus Dominic Cummings in the government as strong a consensus in favour of, of, of the science goal, uh, you know, building up R&D spend to two and a half percent of uh, GDP and creating a science superpower in this country by 2030. I would be surprised if that is sustained. It's incidentally a goal that we set in 2004. It was a 10 year goal, a major, major upward path of R&D spending. Uh, the coalition government missed that uh, target in 2014. I think one other point though about the treasury is the treasury, it does have so much power, expertise, you know, if you take something like the university sector, we've put in an enormous amount of money during the pandemic crisis to bolstering uh, uh, the higher education sector. I think that's uh, uh, right. Uh, personally, I think that this entitles the government uh, to consider and advance uh, a more far-seeing, far-reaching reform agenda in the higher education uh, sector. Uh, I think that future research uh, um, intensive universities need a, a greater uh, focus on generating societal uh, and economic benefit uh, from the, the amount that is invested in uh, research in the university sector. I think we need more US style investment management companies uh, attached to our universities. Uh, rather as they are at Oxford and Imperial and Cambridge, so as to generate internal resources uh, to support uh, university operations, grow the underlying capital that's available. Um, now, if you're going to make these sorts of far-reaching changes and drive reform, you really do need the strength and power of the Treasury behind you. Mm -hmm. you, know, you need a quite a strong external force coming uh, from the Treasury uh, to make other parts of government focus, engage with the reform uh, uh, challenges uh, and, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and see this through because you'll encounter a lot of resistance. I tipped my toe in the waters of university reform, science, reform of science spending uh, uh, and uh, what it was used for. Uh, I, I personally think we need to agree with which universities will specialise in what aspects of STEM research and teaching to force a sort of consolidation and clustering. I dipped my toe in that uh, in 2009-10 and I was uh, rudely uh, repelled uh, by, by, by universities. Since that time we've had UKRI uh, set up. Uh, I think there's it's now a time to revisit how research spending is used, how the research, the science space is organized and whether we can't uh, check, reform the university sector to an extent as well as introduce a more sort of commercial investment minded management uh, dimension uh, to the operation of our universities. Great, thank you, Peter. And thank you, uh, Peter and Margot for 
uh, fascinating con comments and, and for Steve for, for overviewing the report. Um, it's been a really rich discussion uh, about where the UK goes at this kind of uh, Im important juncture. And, and I'm really struck by actually how much consensus there is not just in this conversation, but in others that there have been in recent weeks about this. Uh, it doesn't seem to be a consensus that extends necessarily to the government's approach, unfortunately, but uh, maybe it's early days. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Do uh, uh, keep an eye on our work. We'll be doing, as Steve says, much more work in, on, on the uh, various aspects of this agenda, particularly the industrial strategy one. Uh, so I hope you'll be back uh, and join us again soon. Uh, thank you very much and have a great day.